Welcome back, everybody, to the Deposit That Podcast. First, I would like to thank Chris Rotia of Town Title Insurance, who specializes in commercial real estate title insurance for New York and New Jersey. I'm sure as well as other states, but those are primarily the states that he serviced my past clients and friends for. So thank you, Chris, for sponsoring this episode. Frank, welcome to the show. Uh, it's a pleasure having you. Thank, you. thank you. Everybody, Frank Valenti and I met back in 2013. I had hired somebody who he was friends with, uh, the kid's father, uh, for the mortgage business, a nice Long Island guy. And uh, seven years later, believe it or not, here we are sitting talking about the past seven years. So let's talk a little bit about what was going on in 2013 when we met and how our relationship has evolved both professionally and personally. 2013, I was just graduating uh, college, actually. So um, I was just out on my own. I was kind of just figuring everything out. Crazy was, how time flies, right? Yeah, it's. It feels Sick. like it was a. It feels like it was a year ago. I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> or twenty years ago, depending <laughs> yeah. on what day it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I was pretty much working for my dad at the time. Uh, he had a landscaping company that kind of morphed into a real estate development company. So, that's where it was really more geared to. And uh, I was in college, working full time at you know, d just bouncing back and forth, and. Um, that was really it. After that, I kind of morphed into, I, I started working for somebody else on Long Island uh, doing foreclosures and, and flips, and and I was just managing all, all the construction for the guy. So, What did you think about that at the time? I mean, obviously, we're coming out of a very crazy, you know, cashless market, if you will. No one really had money to lend, and being a builder, contractor, developer, you know, it was obviously tough, you know, getting financing on deals. It was um, challenging. It was, maybe. it was challenging and interesting at the same time. It was um, it was it was for a private bank, so he was buying them, and some of them were actually his own mm -hmm. foreclosures that that he took back from the people. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, was still the the wave from two thousand eight. You know, every, everything crashing. So we're still in that wave. We're still, it or not. still no, in no the one wave. talks about no, it. I know. Still I know. I know. But it was it was like it was a heavy wave right. at that point. That was the title. Part yeah, it. <laughs> it was the title wave. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, so there was just the, uh, there was a ton of houses on the market. Um, nobody really had money to do it. I was working directly with the bank, so he's the guy with the money. Sure. And uh, we were just going in, we we're fixing them up and selling them right back out again within you know six to ten months. Now I know one of the first loans or one of the first business transactions you and I did together were for your de new development you had done in Scarsdale, East Chester on yep. the border. Yep. So talk to me about the evolution of that project, how you went from initially forecasting you selling townhomes to actually retaining some of them and then how you actually piece that joint venture together with the actual original owners of the property. So walk us through so the, cons the, the listeners want to know how basically put deals together, right? Sure. So someone like yourself who said, hey, look, these guys got this land. We have the ability to develop and build and get capital. Mm -hmm. And then you guys bridged your joint venture to wind up making a pretty sweet project. Sure, sure. So that particular project, the guys that, it, 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 these little small towns have crazy politics in them. Uh, it's always a problem. You it don't took, say. It, it, <laughs> it took them about 10 years to get this project approved. 10 right. simple townhouses. It, it, it really wasn't anything extravagant. Um, they ran out of money. They didn't have the money to build to build the project. We came in. We were trying to actually just buy the whole project. And then we said to them, they were kind of like still clinging on, you know. And um, They were holding on like it was their wife. Ex exactly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we just ended up just making a deal. We teamed up with them. Their equity was the was the the land and and the project approval, which is ten years worth right, of work. Right. So they was, pledged the land and the yep, approvals that come with the land. Exactly. Um, and uh, we came in. And it was our job to build the whole thing. And that all projects are all have different variables, but that particular project, the land and the construction, happened to be about a 50-50. Um, monetary split. It happened to be, but in most happened cases it's not like Sometimes that. Sometimes right? it's not. Right. A, lot, a lot of times it's not. If you have a little piece of land and you're going to build a 20-story <laughs> building on it, obviously it's, it's, not, it's, it's a little different. But um, this project happened to work out nicely. So now so. talk to me about how when the market shifted. So again, you guys were originally going to sell them out. Remember we sat down with first-time homebuyers. We did the comms. We priced it out on how to sell yep. them. But then you guys yep. actually chose to retain some of them as investment properties. What caused you to do that? We... Um, Honestly, just the local realtors 
everybody kept coming to us and they're like, oh, you should rent them. You can get $4,000 a month rent for these things. Yeah. I'm like, $4,000 $4, a month for a little 1,400 square foot apartment. Right. For the bonus room. <laughs> exactly, with a bonus room. So I was talking to my dad about it and he's like, you know, we own other buildings. So, you know, we're familiar with, with rentals and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. And we pretty much decided that selling half would would get us our money back and then the the other half of them are, are just you know free we own money, them. free money tax free i don't know about free you but know <laughs> yeah. tax free yeah. money if, yeah. you, if you sell exactly. your bank capital gains but you know, exactly. you have it, or uh, an exactly. asset exactly so it, it, it worked out now you actually did such good work that i believe that you were thinking about even moving into one of them remember I, you were I, like i think i want to buy one I, of them i was i was <laughs> and then i ended up buying a different building and i just didn't even <laughs> it's funny how those things work out but yeah. I, I like looking at i always look at how when you go into a project day one, right? It never, and I say never, turns out the exact way you plan it, right? Yeah. So obviously you've been on the good side of deals and on the bad side of deals. What would you say are the like two or three variables that turn a deal out good, better than expected, or bad, worse than expected, in your opinion? Well, we'll start with the bad first. Um, yeah, hit him where it hurts. <laughs> The time is always and always is always an issue. If you are financing, especially, you're paying interest on that money. Sure. Um, you it know, adds it, up quick. It, it adds up very quick. Um, these towns, like I was talking about, they could they could kill you. You know, on that particular project, that that we had a different punch list every single I week remember. from the town. I every remember. week we would finish it, we would go back to them. And they right. would be like, Oh no, 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 we forgot this and, and this. The garbage or the sewer system, whatever. It, it, was. it was. It was just every day was something else. Right. So. Um, you know they could they could really crush you and there's no way to fight them it's it, it's it's the government it, it, do you yeah. ever see that process being streamlined or at least getting somebody who's competent in that particular uh, position as long as i know it's been like that so Forever. Yeah, I, I, if years. anything it's getting worse right. uh, especially most people don't care at all they, exactly especially at least back in the day they cared or at least you would grease them and they take they, care yeah, of you exa <laughs> back then it was a little bit different yeah. but uh, here's an envelope exactly. sign off on this exactly. today it's like uh, no let me check my instagram account yeah <laughs> i'll be there tomorrow <laughs> if anything it's getting worse because in this day and age everybody's afraid to make a decision yep They're, they no balls they, no balls they have Nobody wants to be responsible. Everybody's yeah. walking on eggshells. Oh, you know, what is this my boss going to say? And this, no, nobody can make a decision. So yeah. instead of making a decision, they throw their hands up in the air and they pass the file to they somebody else. Yeah, and they do, do nothing. nothing. So that's, that's the... Does that deter you, know, you away from doing business? No, truthfully. Sometimes it does. People have approached us with projects in certain areas yeah. and, and or in certain certain stages of the project, and I'm, I just tell them that I'm not even interested. Yeah, look, you might make a million bucks, but it's not worth the headache to it, get that million it, bucks. Exactly. There was a project in New Rochelle recently. And, and New Rochelle's on fire. Yeah. They were trying to sell the property, and you could build about 22 houses on it. The owner should have, and I kind of hinted it to them, they should have, while they were waiting to sell this property, they should have started the approval process, and that would be a little bit more marketable. But right. they were just lazy. They didn't want to do it. They just want to hand it, hand it to somebody. And it's been sitting there for like about 10 years. Serious. Yeah. Well, at least the value's kind of going up, maybe. I, I guess, yeah. So it's, you know. Now let's get into the entrepreneur side of you, right? So you worked for somebody. You got the experience. You worked with your father. You got the experience. You were your father's sidekick, if you will, in his pocket, sure. You sure. Know, holding his hand, watching him do all these things over the course Absolutely. of his career, seeing yep. the ups, seeing the downs. You know, I know we had facilitated a loan on mixed use building for you. You put your office up top and you might yep. have opening up a restaurant downstairs. You have a sure. mold remediation company, you have a contracting company. Talk yep. to me about all your ancillary businesses that you've opened up, why you've opened them up and how you became the entrepreneur that you've become today. So with, with when I was doing those foreclosures and all those flips, um, I also have a, a, an engineering degree and, and construction management. That's right, you're smart too. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that kind of goes hand in hand with that. Sure. And uh, at the time, uh, one of my best friends is a uh, is uh, an insurance adjuster. So he kind of told me with my construction background, there was a there was a you know a need for mold remediation, fire, water, um, you know all the packouts, everything that goes with that. And um, I kind of was researching it for a couple months, and I'm like, all right, so you know for twenty grand, I could buy all the equipment and, and kind of get going. And um, that's what I did. I just you know. The, the foreclosures were kind of winding down. That whole end of the business was kind of winding down. So I ended up buying the equipment. And I just operated for about a year or two out of the back of my pickup truck with just me and two guys out of my parents' garage. That's where I had all my machines and everything. And 
it just kind of blew up from there. What's your mother think about that? Does she care? She, she, she was, she really. <laughs> Frank, does. another piece of equipment here. <laughs> if I was keeping them in the kitchen, that would be a different yeah. story. But. <laughs> Frank, we got a new toy here. Don't mind. I need that. It's like Ghostbusters. What, but what sparked you? All right, so you're like, all right, 20,000 is 20,000. But what, what made you evolve into that space? Did it just make sense? Or was it like, hey, let me give this there's, a try. It's 20,000. There's not a lot of competition. There's, there's very few people that, that do that. There's, you know, most of the people, you know, you see TV commercials for like Serve Pro. You yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's really a bunch of big franchises. It's like Roto Rooter. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, there's no personal touch. So that's one of the reasons why I get a lot of the jobs is because Serve Pro sends two idiots out in a van that, <laughs> that you know, but takes them a half hour to smoke their cigarette and get inside your right, house before right. they even do anything. And they're so, by the hour probably. Uh, exactly. So, you know, there's nobody watching them. They're, you know, they're touching all your stuff. Um, I personally go out to 99% of the jobs mm-hmm. unless I'm really doing something else. Or on your boat. <laughs> <laughs> doing whatever. Right. I, you know, I, I'm, I, I go to pretty much every single job. Meet with the owner. Make them feel comfortable. Well, that's you. That's and your relationship. That's why that's we've always gotten along. Like, exactly. A personal relationship underlying. And that's that's, you know, that's that's the way I do business. But you see so. the world getting away from that, right? You know, again, people. I feel like your average person in the masses. I'm gonna say ninety. I'm gonna throw a number out there. There's no yeah. statistic to prove this. This yeah. is my own. Like maybe I just deal with fucked up people. I don't know. Ninety <laughs> percent of the people would rather deal with a roto router for seventy nine dollar estimate opposed to deal with you who know what you're doing, who's going to come shake hands. You might be, a cu- I'm giving an example, a couple dollars more expensive overall, yeah. but you're getting the shit done right. Yeah. How do you feel like you know, the market's going to move moving forward? Because clearly everyone's going towards targeted ads and being lied to. And they know they're being lied to, but they're okay with that, opposed to how we conduct business on the relationship level, truthfully. I think that, I think that eventually that – that like, we'll just call it like a franchise space, you know, for lack of better words. I think eventually it'll start coming back to the personal small business. I I think, I can't see it. It has to. The whole world can't be running on corporations. (laughs) It it just doesn't work that way, you know. On on Uh, stock money. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'll tell you a a quick story, actually recently, about two weeks ago, I'm doing a big fire job in, in East Chester. You caused the fire or no? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not this one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the the owner of the house, he had Serve Pro, a couple other companies go out there. They gave him lower prices than what I did. But when he called me, I was in front of his house in 15 minutes, met with him, shook his hand. Know the walk, area. Know the area, walked through the whole entire thing, told him exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do this, this, and this. And he ended up giving me the job, even though I was a little higher. And he said, Frank, you know, to be honest with you, you were a little bit higher, but you showed up here. You, you know, you know, you, you sound like you know what you're talking about. Yeah, and not an 800 number. It, it, and, 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 and that's it. You know, these other guys, they just came in, they scribbled things on a piece of paper and they ran out of the house. You know, it, you know I, I was with the guy for about a half hour going through every single step of the process. And Do you think you're right person? I always say, like, you're right audience, you're right customer. I hate the word customer, but unfortunately yeah. it is what it is. Your right customer respects and approves that and that's who you focus on or do you try and convince, you know, know it all Johnny that, you know, <laughs> you're the best option or does it take Johnny for getting screwed over to then come back to you? I think it takes Johnny to get screwed over to come Multiple back. Multiple times probably. Multiple times, yeah. Which which has happened before. I've gotten I've gotten probably about 20, 30 jobs in my career that Another company was on it. They screwed the whole job up, and they, you know, looked online or something. Yeah. Somehow found me through a recommendation or something. And you know what's funny? And I say it's funny. It's funny, like looking back at it. And look, it is what it is. If someone came to me for a loan, let's just say, right, and they didn't listen to me or whatever, they got lied to. They went somewhere else. Now, I didn't take it. So it's when you come to me, it's personal. Like I, I care about our relationship more than I care about closing your deal, right? But if you leave me and go to someone else and they screw you over. When I've told you everything up front, you come back to me, I always charge the client more. This yeah. is a fact. 100% charge the more, gave them a higher rate. Because uh-huh. I'm like, now you wasted my time the first go around. I got to charge you for my time that you basically robbed me out of, right? Yeah. Do you do the same thing with clients that don't listen? Do you always put a little extra on top for yeah. like hey, an ignorance fee? It depends sometimes. It depends. You kind of have to it though, It depends right? who it is, yeah, yeah. I've done it before. It's like, for how many sure. times are you going to jerk me out? I yeah. have people, I swear to God, yeah. I have people from 2010, 2011 that have never given me a lick of business 
and I have probably 2,000 text messages, emails, phone calls oh, yeah, over that time frame. Of course. And I know they're doing things, yeah. but they're not doing it with me. Of course. You know? It's it's just the way it is, I guess. It's the way the world is. <laughs> so now, what evolved you from that side of the world and business into opening a restaurant? The restaurant? Like a hangout? That was really more, um, I bought the building the, the downstairs was empty. It was like an old law office with, with 60 shag rugs. So I, I gutted the whole thing. And uh, me and my friend Mike and my other friend Sal, as another restaurant, 808 Bistro in Scarsdale, we, um, we always wanted to open up a restaurant. I don't know anything. I don't, I, you know, I could barely fry an egg. Your mother cooks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, we always wanted to open one up. And uh, we, we, we partnered up with Sal, who's the chef, and he, he really knows the restaurant business. I, I built the place out and and we just we opened it up and it and it boomed. We we knew going into it that restaurants have a terrible success rate, so we kind of expected it to fail. But the day that we unlocked the door, not one stitch of advertising, there was a line out the door. We also have the following that your backyard, you yeah, crew, you do things the yep, right way. Yep, yep. You know? But it was just um, it, it was it's crazy and it's still still going strong. So, so do you like that business or not really? Um. I like the business. It's it's. I don't regret it. I, it's definitely fun and, and exciting, and you meet a lot of people actually. Sure. And I've gotten jobs from my other businesses. It's a good venue. Through that, yeah. Um, but uh, the, the restaurant business is is crazy. The amount of time and work that goes into it, you you do not get the return. Well, the back. turnover, yeah. the food cost, the management, uh, everything, right? Uh, everything. POS, all that. Uh, it, it all adds up, and and you know, like I said, the the. Hours that you put in restaurant it. hours yeah. are crazy, yeah. it's nonstop, um, right? Pretty it's much. not. It's nonstop, and you, you don't you don't get that money back. But well, you you do full service everything, alcohol, liquor, yeah, right? yeah, Beer, yeah you name full, it. full full bar, everything. everything. So, so if you had to pick one business that you have to go, if you only could choose one to go all in on, what would it be? It would be the fire and water restoration. Serious, business. yeah, not yeah. developing. Developing, you, you know, take away all the politics and the approvals and permits. Do you well, like building or no? Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, I, I feel like that's your passion. Yeah, I, I love building things, but it's just like you said, it's all the politics that go along with it. Right. You know, yeah, path of least resistance. If I could just, you know, buy a house, close, and and build a thing and be done with it in two Put months, some it, uh, it, cardboard in the front, uh, yeah. newspapers <laughs> in the windows, and that's it. You know, but it's. <laughs> So what are you seeing in the market in Westchester County right now? I know we speak all the time about prices and you know who's looking at what, what's going on. Where do you see opportunity and where do you see pain spots right now in the market? I feel like the over over million dollar market is is either is either just flat right now or or actually declining right now. I, I think it's actually declining a little bit. Um, I just feel like that all the we'll say. 55 and up people that own those million plus dollar houses in Westchester are retiring, going to Florida. Their kids are out of school. They, they're they living in a 5,000 square foot house with, with two people in it. They don't and need it anymore. The roof. Taxes are ridiculous. You can't write them off anymore yep. um, or as much anymore. Yeah. Um, and they're putting the houses up for sale. And us 30 something to 40 something year olds are. Can't afford the the, the the million and a half dollar house, or with, don't want the maintenance, or don't want the maintenance with the thirty to forty thousand dollar a year taxes, and that's just what it what it boils down to. It and it, it's 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 crazy, you know. You buy a million dollar house with with you know twenty thirty thousand dollar a year taxes, you got your you, you know you got to mow your lawn, pay your con ed bill, yeah, you, your seven to ten grand a month, easy, easy before even feeding everybody, easy easy seven to ten thousand a month, right. and and people just. Our day and age, everybody's your husband, husband and wife have to have to bring in four hundred thousand dollars a year to, to 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 even be able to afford that and have a decent car and Quality you know what, what are you gonna do yeah, have, have right. a million and a half dollar no, no house and, and, and have a, 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 a you know a, a Toyota in the, in the driveway <laughs> yeah, I mean right. you know Uber, it all Uber. exactly and use Uber I mean you know it all goes together it, 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 you know and and that market is 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 getting crushed right now. I think. Now, on the development side, so I know a lot of homes, at least in northern New Jersey, high-end areas, right? Mm -hmm. The homes are selling for less than what they could be built for in yeah. today's, obviously, inflated cost That's, to build. Yeah. So in your opinion, right, say you're dealing with somebody where money's not an issue, how do you find value? Because I'm giving an example. If it costs $200 a square foot to build, right, but you could buy the house for $150 a square foot, at what point do you say, I'm better off buying this 
McMansion rather than building my dream home, truthfully. It's, it's happening all over the place. Everywhere. It's, Everywhere. Kind of, it's, it's like a negative it's a, market. It's a big it's a big thing. Not not specifically Westchester, but I was looking at a house um, all the way upstate New York near, near Albany. Um, and the house was on 200 acres. It, it had a 4,000 square foot main house with a barn and a guest house. Decent shape, you know, livable, not, not you know, beautiful inside, but they're selling it for, I think, like 400 and something thousand dollars. <laughs> and there's a lot of them up there like 200 that. 200 acres? 200, and two, it's actually a little more. It's like 200. So, what do you make? Like a Pablo Escobar compound up there? For, pretty Too much. It's like, a, uh, you know, I was looking at it for like a, a, a hunting, like vacation yeah, yeah, yeah. house. And, and Why not? you can't, where are you going to get a 4,000 square foot house? Just one of that. Forget about the acreage. That's like a, a whole different issue. You know, you, you, you're lucky you get a half an acre over here somewhere, right. you know. But um, you can't build that. You cannot build that. If I bought that 200 acres and right. to build those three structures on it, I, it cost me about a million seven, a million eight. So easy. My, my my theory, I speak about this all the time, is with the way technology. And look, at the end of the day, I could never, I never have to leave my bed in order to hit thousands of people just by clicking a button. Yeah. Right? Realistically, yeah. the only part that eventually, at least in my business, I have to meet people face to face. Right. Yeah. So, if this area is so saturated, hyperinflated, cost wise, everything's so expensive, why not pick up, move to Idaho, or move to Albany, buy that house, right? And then whatever it is, take a flight, take a train, whatever, drive down here a couple days a week, you know? So wouldn't you think that real estate that's super cheap in ancillary areas, right, has to boom because it's so affordable? Like yeah. You don't need to be in New York City every single day anymore. No, it has to. It, that's that, and, and it's happening, too. I mean, you, you see it all over the news. People in California and New York are, are, are flocking by thousands to Florida, Florida Texas, Arizona, you know, all the southern states that – have no state income tax. Everything is cheaper. Everything is yeah. it's eighty degrees every day. Why? Why? Why would? Why wouldn't you? <laughs> people why, are nicer. People are nicer. Girls why, are hotter. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why wouldn't you go there? Why, you know? Why not? You know. So what do you think happens? I mean, obviously we've never experienced this before in the history of America. This type of migration. I think other than when like Columbus hit like New York. I think Columbus even hit the East Coast. I think he did, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hit the East Coast and then went west, right? Something like that. Like we saw that migration <laughs> west, right? The search for gold. I think yeah. I don't know. I didn't really pay attention to that class. <laughs> but we've seen like a massive migration, if you will, right? I mean, where do we think that the opportunity lies right now in the real estate world? That's something that is a is a toss up. I don't know. It's hard to say that like a New York market would, would you know, I don't want to use the word crash, but, it, you know, could happen. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it could happen, uh, you know. There, but see, uh, and look, so I always say the real estate market in general is performing healthy, right? Yeah. Only because of low rates. Yeah, sure. And with that also being said, the amount of sideline capital, I mean, I called in 2017, there is so much sideline capital, people that are just sitting on buckets and buckets and boatloads of cash that mm -hmm. they don't know what to do with. Yeah. They're like, oh, let's just buy real estate. I'm like, you're, you're making 2% of your money. Yeah, but I just want to buy real estate. I yeah. want to buy real estate, right? And I feel like New York City in general, same thing with you know, parts of California, yep. it's like in Miami, the shiny objects, right? So when people have so much money, they're just going to buy stuff, but they don't realize what comes with it. You mm -hmm. know, so there, as quickly as people are moving out, I feel like people are moving in. They're moving in. And like you said, it's the shiny object effect. They don't realize. Sometimes I see these buildings that come up for sale and, yeah. and, and then I see, the, you know, maybe like six months later, they sell for pretty close to asking price. And then you look at the numbers and you're like, huh? how did, how, how, what are they? I don't know if they have like a, some sort of sec some sort of secret that we don't know about or something, but. The numbers just don't even work. At I, all. I, don't, I don't even know how some of these buildings, multifamily buildings, they're selling in the Bronx for like insane, insane four, numbers. Four caps. Probably worse. Numbers that that you actually, when you sit down and figure it out, you you lose money on it. So I don't even know what I don't know what the what the plan is. I re I really don't. If I if I knew, I don't think I would be here. Right? You know. Right. <laughs> and I, I give people the same scenario all the time. I'm like, look, just because this two family in Brooklyn sold for 1.4 million, right? Does it mean this two family in Morris Park in the Bronx is 800,000? Like you're not getting a good deal on it, you know no. what I mean? Like it's a frame attached two family. Exactly. You're comparing that to a two family brownstone in Bushwick. You know, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Like 
it's still New York City. I get that. But 1.2 million. First of all, your rents are half. Yeah. And you're probably not going to see that same appreciation and gentrification coming into Morris Park that you are in Brooklyn. No. Maybe one day. You, you never know. But I, maybe. You know. But then it's like, okay, look, at the end of the day, there has to be jobs for that, right? And your average person, your average parent across the country, and people are moving in. They're like, yeah, go to Brooklyn. It's cool. It's hip. That trend started over a decade ago, yeah. right? People still think that the Bronx is on fire from the 60s and 70s. So people's parents from, again, from you know Nashville, Tennessee, aren't going to let their daughter move to the Bronx. Move to the Bronx, I know. You know, and that's kind of like the little thing that I see. Like people are so speculative. And what I find is like there's always, from, to answer your question as far as like, you understand why it's going on, there's like a ringleader. And then this ringleader has a network of non-educated real estate people this ringleader raises all this money wants to look like the hero and then goes in and says yeah i just bought this you know slam dunk building in new rochelle yeah you know and you're like wait hold on i just ran the numbers i'm in the business you're gonna lose money but they still proceed and buy it i i, I like i said i wish i knew I, I don't know i don't know what these people think I, I don't know if they just bank on the on inflation maybe that maybe that's their play potential on upside maybe maybe in 10 years they want to flip the building maybe that's their maybe that's their play you know they buy it for a million and maybe in 10 years they could sell it for a million and a half so how do you analyze a deal let's say for example you know obviously whatever comes up in Westchester, i always call you first sure, right? yeah. you're my guy yeah so piece of land comes up in rye hey frank got this piece of land in rye how do you analyze a deal from a building standpoint or from a renovating standpoint um, what for like a multifamily or single family? Really, any deal, any type of real estate deal. It, you you got to analyze what the estimated sale price is going to be. That's usually what That's I where do you start. first. That's where I start. Yeah, ask around, ask a couple of different realtors, do your own research, go online. You know, look at what some stuff sold for, um, and then kind of work backwards from that. You know, I, I was just uh, looking at a, at, a, at, a, at a house in Pelham Manor. Uh, it was a foreclosure, and I kind of thought that. After it was all fixed up, you could sell it for probably like about a million, two, a million, three. And then I asked around and, and all the realtors said, no, you could probably only sell it for a million. So it ended up not. You were 20% over where the yeah, market was. Yeah, so it ended up not being not being a good deal after I figured all the numbers out. But, um, you know, it's it's uh, you really got to do your research and know what you're doing. You can't, you can't just, you know, you can't just wake up one day and be a house flipper. And again, so know. to be clear, you're in the business. You've been doing this pretty much all your life, right? Yeah. So if you anticipated a 1.2 sellout, but the market only said a million, and you do this every single day, yeah. think about uh, Harry who just quit his job at AT&T that's coming in to flip properties. So yeah. if you're off by 20%, I'm assuming he's going to be off by even more. He's going to be off by more. And, and it, a lot of it... Maybe, maybe not in other parts of, of New York, but in Westchester specifically, mm -hmm. there is little, tiny little town bubbles. Mm -hmm. Literally, there's some areas, you, you, you take Scarsdale, for instance. There's some areas of Scarsdale that are completely different than, you could go one block over and the house could sell for another 500000 more. People are like... That's how it is in Teaneck, New Jersey. You know? yeah, yeah, these people are like... Scarsdale, oh, Fox Meadow Lane. Yeah, I got to be on Fox Meadow Lane. That's Need the like, address. That's yeah. like the, that's Manhattan. like the, you could sell a house for probably three, four hundred thousand dollars more just because it's on the Serious. House. Yeah. I mean, it also costs more to get the of house, course, but of course, of course. Um, it, it's very weird. That's why you got to be really, I, I don't like to go outside of my, my world, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah, you know what you know. People call me on Long Island and they, you know, oh, I got this house. I'm like, I, I really don't know t <laughs> enough about it to, you know, to go there or, or Jersey, sure. I, you know, I don't, sure. that's not my world. I don't, sure. I know things are a little bit cheaper. And so well, it's instances. like Jersey city. I mean, so when exactly. I moved to Jersey city, I was like, Oh yeah, move to Jersey. People, Oh, that's great. It's awesome. I go to the bars all the time. I'm like, no, no, I moved to Jersey city Heights. Yeah. They're like, where, where's that? I'm like, not downtown Jersey city. You know, <laughs> again, downtown Jersey city trades at X. Yeah. When I bought in the Heights, it traded at like 30 to 40% of X, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was at a discount, but like anywhere, even the Bronx. Yeah. I've been to the Bronx. I'm like, what part of the Bronx, you know, you're talking about like Yankee Stadium in the South Bronx. So you're yeah. talking about Arthur Avenue, you yeah. know, and there's so many different pockets. Like you said, literally look at Country Club, Throgs Neck in the Bronx. Yep. One or two streets can be the difference between 800 and a million. Absolutely. Or 1.2 million and 1.5 million. Absolutely. So you, you just, you got to really know your market and you, you, you really have to do your research and, and, and know your little niches. And I always like to talk to realtors that specialize in that area. You know, and in that asset class. And in that asset class. But it, local realtors in that area can, can help you. You know, I, I, 
I'm not going to talk to a realtor from Harrison just because I know the, the person right, right. about a house in Pelham. Yeah. I'm Your gonna friend's call... mother who's a realtor. Ex Stay-at-home ex mom, part-time realtor. Ex exactly. <laughs> Hot lady, but <laughs> sucks at real estate. <laughs> but, uh, so how do you how do you balance? you got a lot going on, obviously. How do you balance your personal life with all your businesses? Do you ever shut off completely other than when you're sick on the couch for three, four days? Or um, really? It's tough, I know. Not really. I never really shut down ever. Ever. Uh, even when I was sick, I was still yeah. out You know, every day. You know, checking on my guys, checking on it all my jobs. Stop. It doesn't stop. Um, I, you know, I'm the kind of person that I, I don't really like to sit still. And when I'm home, I feel like I'm like missing something. So, um, <laughs> FOMO. Ex exactly. So I'm, I'm always doing something. Um, but it's a tough balance. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough on, you know, it's tough on your family, your relationships. It's, it's tough on everything. But um, it, it's just something that I actually. I love working and, and building things and, you know, like doing different projects. Yeah. And I, I actually enjoy it. It's, it's, it's not only a, it's a job, but it's, it's actually a hobby of mine. You know, when yeah, I go I, home at night, I'm on my iPad looking at the, you know, looking at deals. Well, so many different at, things. There's always so much going on. It, it, exactly. So it's, um, I enjoy it. Some people are happy with their nine to five job. They go home, they, they click their phone yeah, off. Yeah. They, they, you know, yeah. and they, and, and that's, that's cool. Yeah. You know, if that's, if that's you, that's, that's cool. But that's just, the way I, I am, that's the way I I've operate. researched something recently called flow state. I don't know if you ever heard of flow state. No. Um, so as I've been getting back into the gym, you know, the whole ankle recovery and all this stuff. Life, yeah. when, you know, look, when life kicks you right in the balls, you kind of got to be like, I got to change things, right? Yeah. So my old high school football coach, one of the best guys I know, Coach Beach, literally the best guy I've ever had in my sports career my entire life. I've had some mm. really, really, you know, powerful coaches, powerful figures I've been around. The guy took it when I say I always had my back. May have not always spoken, but when we do, it's it's impactful. Yeah. So he put me onto this thing. I was in the gym. I'm like, I just can't figure this out. Like, why do I keep hitting these blocks? Like, I know I'm stronger than this because if I get pissed off, I do 20% more than I always do. But when I'm not pissed off, I can't get that same type of push, you know, like the whole adrenaline kick. He's like, flow state. So he sends me all these articles. And basically, we're in a world of outside distractions, right? So as an example, you're driving to a potential development site. You get bombarded. Hey, I need you to meet me for this mold remediation. Hey, your girlfriend texts you. Hey, your mom's asking you what time for dinner. Hey, your dad's like, hey, let's go to Florida this weekend. And it distracts you externally from your main focus on getting to the development site and seeing your vision, right? Mm -hmm. And they say it takes 30 minutes, believe it or not, for every distraction to be removed as a distraction. So if you have four distractions on your way to point B, it'll take you, call it two hours, to really get your head back on track, which is I incredible. Got, I don't have enough hours in that day. <laughs> me, 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 me either. <laughs> so entering that flow state and like blocking out the distractions or putting your phone on do not disturb supposedly gets you much more efficient. And I can tell you at the gym, I've entered that flow state combined mm -hmm. with music and my productivity, my results in a matter of a one week have been astronomical just sure. by blocking out those outside I can see that I can see that for sure yeah the problem with me is that, that the fire and water restoration business is an emergency business so yeah. I really Tough. I literally have my phone in my hand all the time just to, you know if you don't answer you don't get the job and it could be a I get it $500 job or it could be a $500,000 job how so, was you know do I like it um no you know eventually you know Hire somebody for those calls. Exactly, I'd like to. Um, I, I have somebody that kind of takes them sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, on you know nights and weekends when I, you know when I. It, it's not the same. It's not the same exactly. Um, how how do you attribute like your success and everything you do to your support by your family? I know your mother and father, and I think your sister are. I know your mother and father at least are very supportive yeah. of you. Sure, sure. How important is that in your growth uh, and the ability for you to scale? Probably the most important thing. Period. We come home. There's a meal on the table. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's number one. <laughs> um, it's 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 probably the most important thing. You know, I probably wouldn't be where I am today without without that. So for sure. Now, what's your father up to these days? Is he still active, or is he's, he kind of passing the torch? No, nah, he's 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 retired. He's just you know. God bless him. He just does whatever he does. And is he up here or down in Florida? No, nah, he's in Florida. He fishes every day. Every day. <laughs> every day. So you look at that pictures of him like God damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does he still? Do you think he misses the game at all, or not really? Nah. He had nah, a good run. Yeah, he's he's done. He's he's done. Completely checked yeah, out. Yeah, pretty much. Is he doing any business down in Florida at all? No, or? no, that's it. He's 
Interesting. He's happy and. Do you feel more it. pressure now that he's removed himself, or do you find it's more of a different strategy now? Um, no, I mean, I, I really, you know, I really, I always did my own thing anyway, kind of, you know, with the exception of when I was growing up, I used to work with him when he had the, the landscaping business, but uh, all the other projects that that we kind of did together, I, I still had my own stuff going on at the time anyway. So um, his, you know, his projects were kind of his and. And my stuff is kind of mine, so it's. Uh, um, is it tough not seeing him every day? Uh, yeah, but you know, I talk to my to my family daily, sometimes multiple times a day. So interesting. Yeah. So as we close up the show, we always leave the listeners with, as you know, as one thing to deposit that to their memory bank. So after all the experiences you've had by the ripe old age of mid thirty, young thirties, what are you thirty now? Hold you. Thirty. Thirty. Yeah. So by thirty, and you've done a lot, obviously. What's one thing you want listeners to deposit to implement their daily life, their daily business, or you know, just overall mentality? It's simple, just just hard work. That's it. It's 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 really simple. It's amazing what what a what a little determination and a little you know, just taking yourself to the next. Even though you're tired and you you know you want to go home, you you do the one extra step and and you feel better about yourself too. And 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 it it. It works. There's no. There's really no substitute. Some people in life just get lucky, and and it happens, and that's cool. But there's no substitute for the actual hard work. You you know you you work hard. You put the time in, and and you could do whatever, whatever you really want. It sounds cliche, but it 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 really is. That's why people say it because it's it's the truth. You know. I'll give you one more question. So, sure. what's one thing that gets you up every day? Um, just the the. The action, the hustle and bustle, the the, the, the doing it, like you know. So basically, if you don't like the action, if you don't like the hustle, you're probably gonna just keep your ass in bed all day. Exactly, yeah, and 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 that's it. Sometimes I, I if I sleep till like eight o'clock, it's it's late, yeah. and I'm like, yeah. oh man, yeah, I'm, I'm behind I'm, the eight I'm, ball. I'm, yeah, exactly, <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> literally, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so everybody, please go follow Frank on Instagram. Thank you again, Chris Rodeo from Town Title for sponsoring this episode, and we look forward to not only a continued friendship, but hopefully we have uh, another good decade or two run left in us to make some money together. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you coming on this. Right.